Hey guys. All right. I am getting some things set up here. I'm so excited. Let me know if you're here in the comments today. We are going to be doing a live workshop on how to plan your writing schedule for 2019. This is going to be really fun. I've got a free download for you guys over on my blog. You don't necessarily, Hey Mickey, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Um, so you don't have to already have the download done. But I have a 17 page writing schedule download for you over on my blog. And like I said, you don't need to have it for the workshop, but you'll want to download it later today or whatever. And you can get it over at heartbreathings.com slash blog. So I'm not sure exactly of the um, exact like URL that you'll go to, but if you go to heartbreathings.com slash blog, it's the very first post there that has the download for this. And if you're already on my mailing list, then you got this in an email today. So you can just download it and check your email. So, oh my gosh, Gina says you, you binge watch till 3 a.m. Oh, yay. I'm so excited. Yeah, you're in the course. That is awesome. Hey guys. Hey, Chrissy. Oh, I see several people that are in the course this round. So I'm excited to see you guys. Um, and so as you know, some of you know, I'm running a, um, <laughs> sorry, I've got messages coming up on my phone. Um, I'm running a boot camp right now that will start on Thursday night. That is a three day intensive goal setting boot camp for writers and creative entrepreneurs for how to set your goals. Today, we're going to be talking specifically about 2019 writing schedule, but I also combine this with my 90 day system. So, Hey Cheryl. Oh yeah. You're in the course too. I'm excited. Um, so I combine this with my 90 day goal setting system because as writers, especially if you're a professional writer, but even if you're someone who like works full time and just writes in the evenings, or if you're a parent and you've got a lot of things going on, you understand that it's very important not to just plan your writing schedule, but also to plan your entire like business, your marketing, your family life, everything else that you're doing. And it can sometimes seem like we don't have enough time to get everything done, which, you know, spoiler alert, but we just don't. We really, in this very busy day and age, we could work 24 hours a day and never come close to getting everything done. So what we have to really do moving into, you know, even more busy times, especially as authors, is we have to really start looking realistically at our time and really thinking about how we're going to set ourselves up for success and where we're going to spend our time versus, you know, just honestly, like for a few years, what I was doing was throwing spaghetti at the wall. I had what I thought was a plan, but really whatever grabbed my attention at any given moment is where I spent most of my time. So I would get up every morning with like a kind of an idea that, oh, I want to write 2000 words today, but an email would come through a message on my Facebook messenger. A friend would call a jillion things. A reader would email me and say, oh, I can't get this to download. And whatever seemed to be the emergency of the moment was 100% what took my time. And so I absolutely failed on the majority of my goals. So what I had to do after some of you guys who have been watching my channel for a while, um, what I had to do was I had to really take a step back after severe burnout and start looking at a better way to manage my time. And so today what we're going to talk about is just this little piece of planning your writing goals and your writing schedule for 2019. And I'm super excited. Thank you. Oh my gosh, we have 89 people here. This is going to be like my biggest live ever. I'm excited. 90 people. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, so in the comments, as we look to the 2019 writing schedule process, I'm going to kind of walk you guys through it. So like I said, I've got a download for you that you can get over on my blog, which is um, heartbreathings.com slash blog. It's the very first post. Or if you're on my mailing list, I already sent it to you through email today. Um, so you can go get that after the, um, oh yay, thank you, Allison. Um, so some of you may already have it downloaded, but it's fine. We're not gonna actually like go through it today. I'm just gonna kind of walk you through the process so that you can do this yourself later. But 
If you are here and you're watching, I want you to give me a yes in the comments. If you have had the past few years of your life where you say, you know, here's my plan for the next year, and you have grossly overestimated what you thought you could do. Like, for example, I'm going to write eight books this year, or I'm going to finish three books. And then you get to maybe March or even January, and you haven't even accomplished a piece of it. Or you say, I'm going to write five books this year. I'm going to have the best year ever. And then you get to the end of the year and you haven't even finished one book. So I'm seeing like a lot of yeses come through. So, oh, and, it, and of course the like hands, yes, yes, yes. This is so common. I think that part of it comes from the fact that, you know, we're creative people and we really love feeling motivated. We love feeling excited. And when we think about having our best year of all time, we think about, how can we have the most productive, like amazing, incredible year? And so when we plan our goals or we set our goals for the next year, it's very exciting to think about the possibilities of what we might achieve. So we look at that and we think, okay, this is going to be the year that I like blow everything out of the water. This is going to be the year I changed my life. Maybe that you're even saying things like this is going to be the year I lose those 30 pounds. This is the year. And we set these huge goals for ourselves. Because being realistic feels kind of like boring. Like, well, if I'm super realistic, does that mean I'm a failure? Should I be like upping the ante every single time, every single time? And it gets kind of exciting to plan those huge goals. But I'm going to make a case today for realistic goals. And it's, I think sometimes it can feel like, oh gosh, I don't want to be realistic. Because when we're realistic, we realize all the things we can't do. Does that make sense? For me, when I look at my schedule realistically, sometimes it breaks my heart because I'm like, but I, if I want to achieve my life's goals, I have to write those seven books this year. And if I don't, then I'm way behind in my whole life. <laughs> and we feel like we put all of this pressure on ourselves to find success really fast, to have our best years, to have our, you know, absolute like yeah, so many books. Christy says so many books calling to me to write. And it's it can be so disappointing to think that, you know, if you have 18 books on your like wish list that you really want to write, and you think about if you can only write two books a year, you know, that's gosh, that's like the next nine years of your life, and you're not gonna get to enjoy any new ideas in the process. And that can start to feel like almost suffocating. Like, but I have to work harder, I have to write more. But my case for thinking realistically is this. You can't do that. <laughs> You're not going to nine times out of 10, when you set goals that are pretty much impossible, you're not going to actually do it. So instead of having your best year, what ends up happening is you carry that feeling and that sense of panic of always being behind, of always feeling overwhelmed, of never getting it done, of having so much to do that you can't possibly get it done, and you sabotage yourself the entire year. And for me, that also would often translate into a lot of negative self-talk. So instead of you know having the most powerful and exciting year of my life, I would trash myself all year long. Like, well, here we go again, Sarah, this was supposed to be your best year. And now you're, you know, it's January 3rd and you're already behind. That means you're not going to do it yet again this year. And what a disappointing blah, blah, blah. And like, I think as creatives, we tend to get harder on ourselves than anybody else is. And if you don't have this problem of negative self-talk and you usually hit your goals, then this is going to be a breeze for you. But I'm talking to the people that really set yourself up for these huge, amazing, like we expect ourselves to be at max capacity, like suddenly, magically, we are going to like 4X our productivity this year. And it's just not realistic. And actually, if you go through, when you go through this process, where we're gonna actually look at our time and how much time you have to produce words next year and to work on your books, you might see that like, in fact, to get those 900,000 words you thought you were going to write, you would have to literally have, you know, be working 29 hours a day, which is not going to happen. Um, so 
we're going to look at it realistically. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a couple of comments here if I can bring that back up. When I think realistically, I feel uber depressed. I teach high school English, so realistically, I wonder what is the point of me writing when so many people don't read. Well, you know, actually, I know you have, you know, you're in high school English, but there actually are probably, I would say, more people reading now than there ever have been because we've got digital books and it reaches people in you know, every single part of the world. So you've got people that are reading that didn't have access to a lot of books before, and you may not see it as much in your high school English class, but I promise you there are millions and millions of readers out there and they are looking for your books and they want you to be successful and to write the books of your heart because they are going to, you know, it's going to change their lives or it's going to entertain them in some way. It's going to impact them. So you definitely, it's definitely worth your time to write. I know it can feel hard to be realistic. But, and of course, when I'm talking about realism here, I'm talking specifically about your schedule and how much time you have to write. So um, I'm going to say, what I want you guys to do for just a minute is really think about if in the past you have approached your goals or your writing schedule from a place of fear. And it might be a hard thing to admit to yourself, but I think that this is why we expect ourselves to have these huge years and we don't get super realistic about what we can achieve because we're afraid. We're afraid that we're not going to be, you know, a full-time writer. We're not going to make as much money as we hoped this year. If we don't write faster, we're not going to, like Christy said, write all these books that are in our heads and, you know, time is going to slip by. If we don't get started now, maybe we're never going to get published. Publishing is getting harder. You know, there's all these things that we can tell ourselves that are coming from a place of fear. And what I want you to think about is stepping back from that fear for just a minute and instead start thinking about what would happen in your life this year if you approached your goals with your writing from a place of power. Instead of from a place of what happens if I don't do this, or maybe I'm never going to be good enough, or maybe I'm never going to make enough money, and just push those kinds of thoughts out of your mind, and instead come from a place of power where you can actually say to yourself, when you look at your writing schedule, you can go, oh my gosh, I can really do this. I can really do this. Instead of looking at your writing schedule and going, oh my gosh, this is going to be the hardest year I've ever had, right? Instead of saying, there's no way I can do this. I know I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm going to be a failure yet once again this year. Instead of coming from that place, come from a place where you say, like shoulders back, head up, I'm actually going to achieve it this year. And that means I am going to get all of these books done, or I'm going to finish my first book, or I'm going to actually write my first rough draft. And how good is that going to feel to be standing here one year from today at the end of December, 2019, having achieved all of your goals? It would feel amazing, right? I promise you this kind of stuff, being realistic about your writing time can be life-changing. So that's why we're talking about today. There's two huge benefits to me, to being super realistic about the time you really have. Number one is it eliminates all those feelings of being way behind. Because when we don't realistically estimate our time, we might do something like say, I'm gonna finish this book in two months. And you're gonna start in January and you're gonna end it by the end of February. But what you didn't take into consideration is the fact that you've got family that's gonna be here till January 5th. You've got a birthday party to go to on the 20th. You've got a trip to LA coming at the end of the month and then a couple of other things going on in February. So you're giving yourself, you think, two whole months to get this done. But in truth, you only have 10 days that are full writing days and you didn't look at your schedule. Oh gosh, <laughs> you're so sweet, Melissa. That you didn't really look at your schedule, you know, realistically. So you're already way behind before you even get started. So that's one thing. You eliminate this feeling. When you look at it realistically, you give yourself the time you actually need to complete your project. You suddenly eliminate all these feelings of not being good enough, of the negative self-doubt, of the negative self-talk. Um, give me a yes in the comments, guys, or some hands. Raise your hand if you 
fall victim sometimes to negative self-talk, like telling yourself, you're not going to be able to do it. Look at how far behind you are. Um, this book isn't any good. I'm not getting the words in. Um, I know I'm going to see a lot of a lot of yeses here because it is exactly it's, Teresa. It's a daily kind of thing. Your inner critic. Yes, I'm. And you, you know, and as you wouldn't be mean to your best friends like that, you're just mean to yourself. And what I want to help you do in 2019, because this is going to make all the difference in your life, is I want to help you eliminate that negative self-talk by setting writing goals, a writing schedule for yourself that you can actually stick to. So eliminates feeling so behind. So we're going to eliminate some of that negative self-talk because you're going to be in a place of power next year instead of a place of fear and overwhelm. Number two, and this is a good one, when you get real about the time you actually have and the number of projects you can actually complete next year, it forces you to focus on the things that are most important. Because let me tell you, when you think that you're gonna get, you know, 10 books written next year, you put all these things on your schedule like, oh, I'm going to write that sci-fi I always wanted to write and I'm going to write a romance and then I think I'm going to write these two short stories and I'm going to do this and we just daydream about all the different things we're going to write in a year. And instead of sticking to a powerful strategy that is going to be, okay, I'm going to write these four books in this one series and really putting yourself like in a place where you're setting yourself up for success, especially, I'm especially on this part, talking to people who want to have a career in writing. If you're here and you're just writing right now without the thought of having a career, the self negative self-talk really applies. But for this second piece, it really, really is so important. If you're actually looking to make money writing, instead of thinking, I'm going to write these 10 books and I am going to, you know, have all of these different genres that I'm going to write and I, you know, oh yeah, I'll get my four series books done, but I'm also going to write these other five things. Then what happens is you get to the end of the year and you wrote like one, you maybe you wrote three books, but they're all in different series, all in different genres. And if you've watched my videos before on how to write a best-selling series, you'll know that especially when it comes to indie publishing, it is very difficult. I won't say impossible because there's always outliers out there and people have different experiences, but it is very difficult to make money as an indie author if you are publishing in multiple genres before you get what I call an anchor series. So if you have not watched some of those old videos of mine, go back and watch that and you'll see what I mean about wanting to keep your writing projects within a schedule. But when you're realistic about your time that you have, you're going to focus in. It forces you to focus on the most important things. And sometimes it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to make tough choices when you go through this workbook. You might have to make tough choices because realistically, you might realize, I'm only going to be able to write two books next year. And then you're going to have to choose from all those amazing ideas that you have, which are the most important two books that you want to work on next year. And that can be really, really tough to do. So what I'm asking you to do is not easy, but it's going to help you become more powerful and more focused. I love it. Um, oh gosh, how do you say your name? Evil, evil line? Eve, evil, I don't know. I don't know. I love your name though, but focus is my word. Focus should be my word next year. I totally agree. I think that um, focus is a really good word. I'm thinking of maybe using the word intention, like in, intentional. Um, I'm still working on my word for next year. But before we get into the process for um, the planning. I'm going to just tell you one more little thing about my life. And some of you may have heard this before if you've heard me speak or you've seen some of my previous videos, but this is something that super applies. So this is where I have to get real about my own faults. But for many years, especially after I started actually making money and having, this is like money that I relied on in my income, I would set myself up at the you know end of the year, every year, and I would go to Google Calendar and I would print out 12, all 12 months calendar, blank calendars. And I would sit there with all my different colored pens and highlighters, you know, I've got, I've got all the different colors and I would plan my writing schedule for the year. And instead of being super realistic and going through the process that I'm gonna show you today, I would, it was like an alien would take over my body and I would suddenly be like, I'm going to have the best 
year of my life and I'm gonna, like if my daily average is 2,000 words a day, I'm gonna own it and I'm gonna write 5,000 words every single day and I'm gonna write 900,000 words this year. And I am not even kidding, guys. I would, I would be like, my best year I've ever had is 140,000 words, which really is an awesome year. I'm gonna blow it out of the water. I'm gonna write 900,000 words next year. And so I would plan out this whole schedule. I'm going to release this book here and I wouldn't take any time off between books. I would be like, I'm going to finish this book on Friday. I'm going to start the next one on Saturday. And I would just put this crazy expectation on myself because I wanted success so badly that I thought the only way to get there was to plan this ridiculous schedule. And I would tell myself that story. The only way you're going to get there, Sarah, is to write as fast as you can, to push yourself as hard as you can. And all of that came from, yes, very stressful. All of that stuff came from fear. Fear that I wasn't good enough, fear that what I was doing wasn't enough. And what would happen every single time? I did this for like three years in a row. And what would happen every single time is that I would get to somewhere around January 10th and I would already be so far behind that I was gonna have to push the scheduled book back because I was expecting myself to do so much in such a short period of time that my whole year would already be messed up by January 10th. So instead of just throwing my schedule out and being like, okay, I'm gonna give myself the time that I need and being peaceful and you know trying to hit my goals at that point, you know what I would do? I would go back to Google Calendar. I would print out 12 more blank documents and this time, instead of being super realistic about my time, I would say, okay, well now I'm behind. So instead of writing 5,000 words a day, I've got to write 6,000 words a day to catch up. Well, that, I mean, I look back on it now and I'm like, well, that was the dumbest thing I ever did. But I told myself this story that if I don't push myself to have the best, biggest, most amazing year, if I don't push myself to be in a completely different person than I am right now, then I am never going to have the success that I want. And so the whole year I would fall behind and behind. And instead of feeling powerful and realistic and excited about my goals and checking them off and feeling really good, I would feel negative, behind, depressed, lazy, frustrated. And I would blame myself for every single day that I didn't get the work done. And as you can imagine, and as some of you probably know, when you're feeling down and depressed and you're feeling like you're not achieving your goals, is it easy to write? <laughs> no, it is not easy to write. It is definitely not easy to write. The more you get down on yourself, the harder it is to be creative. And I made a choice when I pushed myself to such of a limit that I, yeah, uh, Casey says, went into a several year writing black hole. That's exactly what I did. It was almost, it was a full year and a half where I did almost no writing. I watched a lot of investigation discovery, a lot of true crime documentaries. I ate a lot of food, binge food. Um, and I just couldn't write because I had pushed myself to a limit and I had almost convinced myself that I was just never going to be the writer that I wanted to be. So when I finally came out of my uh, investigation discovery haze and decided to get my life together, I started putting together a plan. And this is the plan that has evolved into my 90 day planning. If you've seen my videos on the Kanban board and my planner and this boot camp and all of these things that I've put together, as well as the process that I'm gonna walk you guys through today, that has helped me, I mean, I'm telling you, transformed my life. And because of it, I am happier and it's a crazy thing that happens when you actually just take a realistic look at your schedule and you stop expecting yourself to be superwoman or wonder woman at every turn or to be your number one best self times 10 at every every single day and you be realistic about hey sometimes we have bad days sometimes we have you know sick days being realistic about you know how much time we need after a writing conference or you know like i saw marissa mohi on here um which i love her youtube channel you guys should check her out if if you have not yet um but she 
has a video coming out like every single day of Preptober. Then she's got a video, I think, coming out every day for Vlogmas. Is that right, Marissa, if you're still here? Um, so, you know, hey, it's got to be a little bit tough to be putting out a video every single day if that's your plan and writing 2,000 words a day. So someone like Marissa might have to, if she really wants to follow through on this goal of you know, videoing every single day, she might have to cut back realistically on her writing schedule. I don't know about Marissa, for sure she can chime in if she wants, but just saying like, sometimes you have to be realistic about what you're capable of instead of expecting yourself to be like max capacity 365 days of the year because it's just not realistic. And when I stepped into this powerful, oh, she says, I totally cut back on writing for video. And it's it's just a truth. It's like whenever you decide to do one thing, you're deciding not to do another. You decide to go to a writing conference, you're deciding not to probably write that week. Whenever you decide to go to the beach with your family, you're deciding not to have as much writing. But those things are important too. So um, when we look realistically at our schedule, we're going to look at all these things in just a minute. And I'm going to walk you guys through this process. Um, but when I stepped back into a place of like powerful, this is the schedule that I can stick to. I know I can do it. I'm going to really intentionally plan. I have had the single most productive year of my life. And it's not just because of the planning. It's because the joy that comes from not constantly telling myself that I'm behind and not constantly feeling like I'm in panic. It sort of opens up your heart to say, you know, when you embrace every single day feeling like you're in control of your schedule, it is magical how much you can get done. So with that being said, my own personal little experience there, I'm going to just briefly kind of walk you guys through this process. Teresa says, I don't remember what it feels like to not be behind and I completely understand what you're feeling and um you know these these courses this type of thing going through this process it's not going to like change your life overnight or maybe it will but if you keep working this process of planning things out being realistic being mindful and being kind to yourself is going to transform not only your writing career but your life i promise you um one of the things that people just don't tell you is that being a successful writer is like 80 percent about mindset and if you cannot get your mind in the right place, it is going to be very difficult to have a truly long-term career because there's a lot of things that are going to come your way that are going to try to bring you down, like feeling like you're behind, you know, discouragement when you can't get your, um, you know, your next publishing deal or however many sales you got or bad reviews on your books. It's going to happen to all of us. So the, the stronger you can get and the more pressure and stress you can take off of yourself in your day-to-day -day living, your day-to-day -day schedule, the better off you're going to be. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this um, writing schedule workbook. So um, Claire says, can the workbook be printed in A5 size? I have not tried to print it and I only made it for the letter size because I just didn't have time to resize it. Um, let me get back to you on that, Claire. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i try printing it myself and see if you can like fit to page and make it work. It may not be exactly the right dimensions, but um, we'll see. It may not be that difficult for me to resize it. I'll let you know. But for now, it's in letter version. Now, if you've downloaded this already, you'll see that there are pages and pages of explanation, which I'm not going to walk you through all of that, but you can read it on your own. Um, but it kind of talks about why to do this, like we talked about. Um, but the actual step-by-step -step process that you're going to use when you go and grab this download is, number one, what I have... Um, no, you don't have to follow along, Melissa. I'm just going to kind of explain it to you. And then later, you like when the broadcast is over, you can go and download it and um, use it for yourself. Or if you don't want to grab the download, you, you can kind of listen to my explanation and you can just print your own calendar and do it. Um, it's a pretty easy system, but it's so powerful. So I'm just going to show you guys really quickly for those of you that have not downloaded it. So I'm not sure how well you can see this, but in and it's backwards i think but in this download you have little mini calendars like this for every single month of the year and so what we're going to do is we're going to realistically look at your time for 2019 and we're going to kind of sketch out your writing plan now everybody who goes through this is potentially going to be in a different place so 
Some of you that are watching, maybe you've never written a novel before or you've started books but you've never finished something. Some of you watching may have finished 40 or 50 books and be publishing and you know hitting the New York Times. Um, so, and a lot of us are gonna be somewhere in between, right? So, gosh, I knew eventually I was gonna get some kind of bad comment. We'll see, how do I? Okay, I'm hiding that user, so hopefully you won't be able to see that. Apparently YouTube Lives always get some kind of like bad comments, so we will just ignore that person. Um, okay, so what you're going to do is when you print this out, you're going to have a full kind of mini calendar for every single month of the year, all 12 months, and you're going to go through this system of realistically looking at your time. So yeah, there's always somebody. Um, I knew it would happen, but I think I know now how to get rid of them. So first step is you're gonna look at your entire calendar for 2019. And guess what, guys? This, for those of you who are planners like me, this is your chance to grab some color-coded pens and it is gonna be amazing. Um, and it's, you know, you know you're, you've made it when the perfs start bugging you. Yes, it is sad, but true. I have arrived. I'm much more excited about the fact that there are almost 150 people here live. I'm so grateful to you guys. Y'all are awesome. Um, so this is your chance to like actually pull out some color coded pens, which is super, super awesome. Um, so it's like a chance to actually like play with our stationery, which is great. So what I want you to do first, step one, when you get your calendar is you are going to mark off every single day next year that you will probably not be writing. And this is where some of us get ourselves into trouble because we think that oh, I'll write on Christmas Day. I mean, maybe I never have before, but I could do that. I mean, you know, I used to tell myself things like, well, I've got this whole week that I'm gonna be gone for this RWA conference, but I'm gonna take my laptop and I'm gonna write in the evenings. And then every year I would go and get zero writing done. So this, when you're going through the schedule, this is not a time to imagine that you're gonna do things you've never done before. Like you're gonna be, oh, well, we're going on a two week vacation to Florida, but I'm gonna take my laptop and I'm gonna write 40,000 words. Like, don't put yourself in that position. This is the time to be realistic. If you are not someone who typically goes on vacation and gets a lot of writing done, then don't expect yourself to do it this year. Um, if you end up actually doing it this year, then it's just bonus words, right? Oh, I love Le Pens, they're my favorite. Um, oh, I think you, you posted a picture of those too. Very cool. Um, so what you need to do is you're gonna go through your schedule and you're gonna mark off all those things. So mark off if, you know, holidays. And yes, um, who, let me see, it's going by quickly. Lori says, I've, I hear other authors saying that they write every day. And I have, I know friends, I have friends that do write every single day. It's like Christmas day, they're still posting in a group saying I got 5,000 words today. And that is great, if that is you, then count those days. There's no judgment here, there's no comparison. Just be yourself, know what you do. Oh, hey Brenna, um, yes you can, it'll be on um, replay after the workshop is over. So the first thing you have to do is be a realistic, look over the entire calendar that I've given you and just mark off those days that you won't be working. You can either like black out through them or you can put washi tape over them if you wanted to, whatever you wanna do, but just mark off those days. It can be a slash through the day or whatever. Holidays, vacations. Um, I have days that are um, I'm going to talk about that, Tamara, and that'll be step two. So um, Amy says, does this include your day job? So it depends for you if you write on days that you work. So this will be very, very personal to you. If you have a day job and let's say you work Monday through Friday and you cannot spare any time for writing in the evenings because you've got a family, you've got everything else. So weekends are your only days to write, then mark off every single day that is not a weekend. And, you know, this is, it, sometimes it's painful to look at our writing schedule realistically, but sometimes that's what we have to do. Um, you need to be like specific about your own schedule. But if you write, you work from say 8 a.m. and you get home at 5.30 and you always try to write 30 minutes at the end of the day when you get home, then you don't mark those days off. You leave those as working days. And we're gonna talk about the estimate of time 
in terms of how many words you can do per day in step three. So if there's, you're not gonna get any writing done that day at all, like no writing, no editing, no publishing task, it's not a working day for you when it comes to your writing, mark that day off. And um, we're gonna talk about editing specifically and so on in like step three. But for now, if it's like, I call them working days. If it's not a working day, so you're not gonna be working on any kind of task, you won't be plotting, you won't be writing, no writing is getting done, then mark that day off as a non-writing day. So one thing to keep in mind when you're going through this part, and I kind of, you'll, when you go through and you read this, you, I kind of touch on this a little bit as well, that you might end up saying like, let's say you have a conference or I'll, I'll tell you, I just booked a flight to LA in January. So I'll be flying out to LA on January 8th and I'll be gone until the 12th for a business uh, conference. And I already know that it's not just going to be, you know, those four days that I'll be not writing. On the seventh, I'm probably not gonna write either because I'm gonna be packing, I'm gonna be getting ready for the conference, I'm gonna be, you know, making sure everything's set up, double checking my airfare, I'm probably not gonna be writing. I also know that on that Sunday the 13th, I'm probably not gonna be writing that day either because I'm gonna be coming home from a eight hour flight and four days of like being an extrovert and I'm gonna just need a day to chill. So on my schedule, I'm not just going to write off the 8th to the 12th, I'm gonna write off the 7th to the 13th. So some of this will be something that you'll learn over time as you become more aware of this. And some of it, you're just gonna use your past experience. So like, for example, if you know your birthday is September 12th and you never work on your birthday week, then mark that entire week off. If you know that your family is going on vacation for July 4th and you'll be gone for four days, but it's gonna take you usually two or three days to pack everything and get it ready, then you need to mark off the three days before as well. So this is where you get super, super realistic of exactly what days you're gonna mark off. So this is things that are already on your calendar, vacations, any kind of holidays that you don't plan on having any kind of work done. Um, I like to also mark off about a week at the end of December because I know I'm gonna be planning um, for the next year. So anything like that that you know you're gonna do, you'll mark it off. Step two is where we deal with unexpected events. Somebody asked about this a little while, like what about things that come up? So in step two, what you're going to do is you're going to mark off, oh, actually, let me go, let me, reel it back just a second. So when you go through and you mark off all the days, what I want you to do is I want you to count up how many days you marked off. And there's a place for you to put it into this sheet. You'll see it right here. So you'll take 365 days minus however many days you marked off. So let's just say you marked 20 days off as like, I'm not writing these 20 days of the year. Yours is probably going to be a lot more than 20, but I'm just using that as a number. So then you'll write in the total days remaining is 340 days of work time next year. So that will give you a good estimate of how many days that you, you know, actually have to work next year based on your schedule. But we're going to take it a step further in step two. And like I said, you can take notes if you want, but I have all of this stuff detailed out for you in the handout as well. Um, so step two, now that you have all of your vacations and obligations and everything marked off, in step two, what you're going to do is you're going to estimate about how much time on average you need for unexpected things that come up. So the, the kind of things, like obviously there's no way we can know because we don't have a crystal ball to say, oh, you know, you're gonna get the flu this year or whatever. But we're just gonna estimate, you can look back at 2018 and kind of get a good estimate of how much time you've got, you know, for next year. But this is where you're gonna estimate how many days do you think you need on average for the year or for each month for your children getting sick? How many times a year do they probably get sick that maybe you can't work? or days when you've got to deal with um, something with your pets that you've got going on, or how often do you get sick? And this is gonna be different for everybody. Like my husband has allergy problems, so he's sick several times a year from allergies. Um, how often do you have migraine headaches? How often do you just have 
blah days where you just don't feel like writing. I put in at least three days a month that I know I'm just not gonna write. Not because I have an obligation or because I have a headache, but just because I don't feel like writing. And I always come across it, it's a melancholy thing, maybe it's hormonal, but it just is always on average three days a month when I'm not gonna write. So I count those days off as it is. So then what you'll do is there's a section in the workbook where you can write in what reasons you're taking off. So you can write like, you know, for family health emergencies, I'm gonna take 10 days off next year. For, um, you know, blah days, I'm gonna take three days a month, so that means 36 days I'm gonna take off next year for that. Then you add up all those like unexpected days and you give yourself an estimate and you put it in this box at the bottom. Does anybody have any questions about that? It'll make more sense when you actually see it. Um, now, of course, that's harder to put on a calendar because you can't really say, um, you can't really say, well, I'm gonna be sick on January 10th, right? You can't really know when you're gonna need those breaks. So it's harder to put on the calendar, but what I want you to do is get that number. So let's say you're gonna take an additional 40 days off next year for unexpected things or mental health days or illnesses or whatever. So you had 365 days to begin with. You took 20 off for your obligation. So now you're down to 345 days. Then you take another, um, what I say, 40 days off. So now you're down to 305 days. So yes, and it is, it is funny how we forget to take days off in our writing lives. Like most people working regular jobs take weekends off, they take vacations and they don't work. But as writers, we kind of are always working in a way. And it, once you become a paid writer, a published writer, it gets worse and worse and worse because you have lots of other things to do. So um, it, this is super important to give yourself that time to understand there's just going to be days when you don't write because you cannot realistically look at your schedule for next year and what you're going to get done if you don't give yourself those migraine days, those mental health days, those days off when you're at conference or those days off for Christmas or whatever it is in your life that you need that. So what you'll do at the end of step two is you'll take the days remaining from step one. In our example, we had 345 days. Then you'll subtract the days that you just estimated you would need off for step two, which I estimated at 40, and now you're down to 305 days of working days for the year. And I have this little calendar note here because these are unexpected things. You can't know where you're gonna place them on your schedule. So what you, you can do instead, this is kind of up to you. Oh, hey, Bethany. Um, this is kind of up to you that you can either go to like December 31st and mark off 40 days, just so you kind of get an idea of your calendar. Or let's say you have 40 days, you can kind of do like 40 days divided by 12 months. I'm gonna take, you know, three days off of the beginning of every month. But the key is that you need to account for these 40 days somewhere in your schedule, even though it's not actually gonna be the days that you're sick. Does that make sense? I really tried to explain this in the process here, but if you have, let's say, 40 days set aside for unexpected events, what I like to do is I'll go to the very end of December 31st and I'll just mark off the 40 like days available from the end. Those are not, I'm not gonna get sick all 40 days at the end, but it gives me an idea when I'm setting up how much I can get done in a year of exactly what I wanna do. So hopefully that will make sense. And like I said, if you don't wanna, cluster all 40 of those days or whatever at the end of the month, just add them to the beginning of each month to kind of give you an idea of not exactly the days that you're gonna be sick, but it gives you an idea of how many working days you have every month of the year. So yeah, could, yeah, Deborah, she says it makes sense I need to do this for my day job schedule. This can really, that's why I said it's good for writers, but it's really good for anyone trying to like set goals or manage their time. So um, Melissa says, when you add these extra days to your calendar and then adjust your daily work count needed and you don't end up needing those days, you end up ahead of your own count expectation. Yes, exactly. So if you estimated 40 days and then, hey, you know what? You actually didn't take those mental health days you could end up ahead this year. I mean, how good would that feel? 
to be like September and you've already like hit all your writing goals. Cause then guess what? Now you get to write some extra projects next year. That would feel so much better. Wouldn't it? than like getting to January 13th and being like, well, I'm already behind it. My whole schedule is screwed. It makes so much sense. This is a way that you set yourself up for being ahead and just, I mean, I don't know about you, but that just makes my heart feel like, <sighs> like excited and motivated and light. And it, trust me, it's just like save. It's like a savings account was what you're doing. You're giving yourself the room and the space to take days off when you don't feel like it or to have sick days without panicking. It's a very powerful thing. So once you've done those first two steps and you have your estimated number of work days for the year, you're going to move on to step three. So this is where it gets a little bit trickier and there might be more questions. So if you go through this process later tonight or you know sometime before the beginning of the year and you think, okay, I need clarification of this, don't hesitate to send me an email or a message or something. My um, email is sarah, S-A-R-R-A, at heartbreathings.com and I will help answer your questions because it'll make more sense when you're actually going through it. But I'm just gonna kind of give you a little walkthrough. So where this gets trickier is because it's going to be specific to each one of you that are filling this out. And there's no way that I can tell you. Some of you, like I said, have been writing for years. You've finished 20 novels, you've got your system down, you know exactly how many days it takes you to write a book or how many days it takes you to edit. And those people who know how long it takes them and they're able to stick to a schedule, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to estimate how much time it takes you to complete a project. But for those of us who, you know, one project might take three weeks and another project might take six months or if you've never finished a novel before and you're still working on finishing that first one, it might be a little bit more difficult to you. So you're going to have to work with just your best guess estimates. And I would encourage you as you are estimating your projects for the year, underestimate. <laughs> Lori, even if you finished a bunch of books, you still feel clueless. Yes. That is very true. I feel that way most of the time. I'm like, ah, uh, how am I, am I going to be able to finish this by the end of the year? I don't know. We'll see. But I will say after following this process for this entire year, for the first time in my entire life and career of eight years indie publishing, this is the first year that I finished every single book that I said I was going to finish except one. And I am working on it. I am determined to finish it by the 31st. So that is, is a powerful thing for someone who never, ever, ever could do it. So um, take it from me, this system works. It just might take you some time to estimate exactly how many you need to do, like how, how much days you need to finish each thing. So we're aiming for our best guess. We're aiming for being realistic in terms of how many words you can write next year. We're not... Um, you miss a lot. So make sure that you go in and, and you can watch it from the beginning. But we're basically talking about this um, process of choosing how much time and deciding how much time. So now what we're working on is which projects you're going to work on in 2019. So if how many of you actually, this will be a good question. How many of you know already, how many of you that are here now know what your average word count is per hour. Not your like, you, you're you high on three Red Bulls and you've got like techno beating in the background, like best word count of all time. But like, what is your average on any random day? Like, what's your average word count? Um, my average word count, I figure out, so Claire knows 1500 per hour, um, 75 words per minute, 1,200 per hour. It depends on the hour. Yes, we're not, I know, but average, we're going average. 1,000, 1,000, 180, 2,000, 300 words per sprint. So it kind of depends how many sprints you can do in an hour. 900 words, draft a chapter in 25 minutes. So a lot of you know, and some of you don't know. If you are someone who does not know how many words you can do in an hour, so Bethany says, I'm not sure per hour, but per day, I can do 2K comfortably for a couple of weeks. Um, so that's good to know too, like per day. And it's fine if all you know is a per day instead of a per hour. Um, 
Some people know about 500, 900, 2000, 1800 an hour. If you are one of the people here who does not know your average word count, one thing that you can do over the next few days is do a couple of writing sprints. And so I've talked about this before because it's one of my favorite things to do. It's like set a timer for 25 minutes and just sit and write for 25 minutes. And when the alarm goes off, check your word count. So you gotta check your words when you start. How many words did you have at the beginning versus how many words you have at the end and then subtract. And you'll find out what how many words you added to your manuscript this 25 minutes. Then take a five minute break and do it again. And then take a five minute break and do it again. And then come back tomorrow and do it again. And do a couple of days to, you know, figure out what your average is. And you may have some sprints that you get 500. You may have some sprints that you only got 150. So take the entire bit of your like three days of sprinting, divide it by the number of sprints that you did and get your average number per sprint. And that will give you your average per 25 minutes if that's the increment you used. And you know you can get two of those sprints done in an hour. So let's say your average was 300, then that means you multiply it by two and you get an average per hour of 600 sprints. Does that make sense? Hopefully yes, I explained it well. Um, Teresa, I use an Android app called Writeometer. It's just the word write with O meter at the end of it. Um, it's my favorite. I don't know if there's a corresponding kind of iPhone app, but I use that. Um, but you can use any Pomodoro timer will work for you. You just can't always put your word count in. Um, so you might need a notebook or a planner to put your word count in. So just saying. Um, yeah, you know what, Alice, somebody told me that they thought maybe it was taken down and I still have it maybe because I downloaded it before, but it's possible maybe they're like revamping it. So if you don't see it, it might be off the market. I'm not 100% sure. So yeah, so you could bujo, um, you could bujo your trackers. In my planner, there's also a sprint tracker. Um, if you end up downloading my uh, HB90 method, 90 day planner. Yes, uh, Lori says she uses the word count tracker for my Etsy store. So you guys can you know, find that at the end of the planner. So you can use that if you'd like. But figure out what your average words per hour or your average words per day. And then what you're going to do is you're going to look at all the days that you have left. So in our example, we had 305 days and we're going to, what you don't want to do, this is what I did for a while is I said, oh, well, I can write 2000 words a day. I've got 305 days to work. So that means I can write 305 times 2000. <laughs> well, that is not taking into account what? Uh, you've got to edit this book you've got to publish it, you've got all these other tasks that have to happen. And even if you're not at a stage where you're ready to publish it, you do have to actually edit that book. And if you're like me, you will find, yes, revision, editing, and promo, Brenna says from one of our best-selling authors that's watching here. Um, yes, you've got a lot of other things that you have to do besides just the writing of the book. Some people are gonna go through several revision drafts before it's even ready to go out to an editor. Also, for me, I have to take into account that as much as I would love to be the kind of person that you know, finishes a book on Sunday and starts a brand new one on Monday, I just have not gotten to a point where I'm capable of doing that. I always end up needing at least a week or two off completely between books. So if, like I said, if you have not finished books yet, you might need to, you know, pay really close attention to how things are going for you this year. If you find out, you know, pay attention to your habits, pay attention to what you need. If you need two weeks off or a month off in between writing your rough draft and doing your edits, then when you figure out your schedule for 2020, you're going to take that into consideration. So if this is your first year planning in this way, you might not be perfect at it. And you know what? That's okay. But you're going to be one step closer to being where you want to be. And then next year, the following year, you'll be even closer because you'll have more information. So step three is all about actually going into the calendar where you have all these days that are already marked off and start planning out your projects. So this is kind of the fun part, but this is where you have to really be careful not to overestimate what you can do and remember when you go in and you do this process um, which I'm going to kind of walk you through and 
Um, I'm not going to go over this super in detail, but like I said, if you meant, if you uh, get through this process for yourself, once you download this and you are lost, just reach out to me and I can do maybe another live before the end of the year or, um, another video kind of clarifying if there are a lot of questions that come in, but you definitely want to count off like any day that you have marked off you're not going to count that as working day remember because you've marked that off as this is a day that i'm not working so let's say you move on i'm not sure if you guys will be able to see this very well on the video um, plus it's backwards but you kind of get an idea that i have a little project for you in this download where you are going to be able to write the name of the project and then i've got the different stages of the project for you on one side and then on the right side you have an estimated number of days that you think it will take you to complete that stage of the process so let's say for example for most of us for many of us project one of next year might not be a brand new project how many of you um, who are watching live oh it's not backwards for you guys it's backwards on mine um like when i look at it but maybe it flips it for you guys well that's good to know um okay so how many of you are going to be starting a brand new project like from scratch in January, January 1st? And how many of you are carrying over to like finish a previous project in January? I will be finishing a project. I'll probably be in edits, I hope. I'm praying that I'm going to finish this book in rough drafts and I'll be working on edits. So Leanne says both. So a new project and carrying over. A lot of people carrying over. Christy just says, nope, I'm not sure what that means. That might mean no, not starting something new, carrying something over. Um, editing your nano book. Yeah, a lot of people. So both. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind when you're going through your different projects is that some of these things might overlap. So if you know your process and you know that you can be drafting a book here while also working on publishing or revising a different book, then you don't have to, like, you can kind of double count those days. But for most of us, we've only got that one kind of writing task. So make it work for you. Um, there are no rules here, except that I want you to be realistic. So a lot of people are starting new books and a lot of people are carrying over so it kind of depends um carrying over carrying over so a lot of us are carrying over so the process the parts of the process that i have labeled for you in this project box are plotting your rough draft your edits and by that i mean your self edits the stuff you're actually going to do and if you want to you can actually add on days for um like let's say you send a book out to your editor and then two weeks, three weeks later, they send it back to you and you know it'll take you about three days to go through their edits and like apply them to your book and then you send it to beta readers and you're going to take you another week. Go ahead and add that and count all of those different parts of your editing process as days you need to edit and then publishing. So plotting, rough draft, editing, and publishing. If one of these stages does not apply to you, so for example, you are not in the publishing process yet. You're just not. Don't count it. Just mark it off. No big deal, right? This is not a time for you to be like super specific about, oh, I've got to follow these rules or exactly what Sarah says in here. If you're not in the publishing phase, just cross it off. No big deal. Um, if you don't plot, for example, and all you do is like write down a few ideas and you pants, then just mark the plot off. So if something doesn't apply to you, don't count it. If there's something I didn't include on here that you need time for, add it in make it work for you but let's say project one if you're carrying over a previous project like i will be and a lot of you are going to be carrying something over you will count that as project one of the year because you're still going to have some part of these stages so for me let's say project one would be fate surrender the plot is done the rough draft will be done by 31st mark my words um so i will be in edits so let's say I know I need 21 days to edit my book. And that includes days that the beta readers get it back to me and so on. Let's just give that an average, say 21 days. What I would do at that point is I would go back to the end of this workbook to my January box. And I would find the first available working day. And I would start counting my working days only 21 days. So for example, let's say on my sheet, I had the first and the second and the third 
marked off. So you can kind of see that. Let's say I had those days marked off because my sister's gonna be here. So I would begin counting my 21 days on the fourth. And usually what I will do is I will assign a color. So this is like a greenish teal color. Let's say this is my color for Fate Surrender and every book or every project has a different color. Then I would start actually counting the number of days and I personally like to number them out. So for example, if you guys can see this, I would start numbering them. Day, here's my first day, my second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day of edits. And I would keep going until I got to 21. And if there was any day in between that was a marked off day, like if it was in this way, I hit day six, oh, cause that'll, can't get it to focus quite, quite, maybe if I put the pen up next to it. If I get to day six and then these two are not working days, I can't count this as day seven. I would have to just gloss over those and then move to this day as day seven. Does this make sense? I'm gonna address that um, question, Deborah, in just a second. So I would count up until I have 21 days and that would be my average estimate of how much time I need to edit. Then I would go to the next stage in the process and I would say, let me find the right sheet. And I would say, okay, once my edits are done, how many days do I need for publishing? And what I want you to remember here is that we're not actually so much setting our schedule, like the actual days, because remember, like I said, you don't know which days you're gonna get sick. You don't know which days your son is gonna need you or you're gonna have to take the dog to the emergency vet, you know, whatever, you don't know. So you, this is not necessarily saying this book's gonna get published on January 12th or whatever, but this will give you an estimate of how much you can get done in the next year. Are you guys with me on that? because this will give you that estimate of how much time you need and it's less about the actual dates and more about which projects you can complete in the year. Because I have found for me personally, it is more important because if I set a date and I say, well, this book's coming out February 12th, I'm usually not gonna hit it. So the date isn't as important on my writing schedule as knowing this book is getting done and it will be published next year. Give yourself that freedom instead of feeling like it's gotta be done by this date. Now, sometimes we do have to actually like schedule out our editors in advance and that kind of thing. Um, so if you guys wanna see more videos about um, sort of how to plan in advance for your editors and work your schedule in to actual publishing dates, um, let me know and I can talk about that a little bit more specifically because sometimes when you are self-publishing and you have to hire your own editors, you have to have them booked months and months in advance. And a lot of editors will, give you some leeway like okay it's not done today but you're going to get it to them in a week and that's fine um but some editors if you miss that date they just can't fit you in anymore and you got to find somebody else so yes christy set yourself up for accomplishment um it's super super important so this particular style of planning here is you know is much more about figuring out how many things you can do next year and less about exactly which dates they're getting done. And um, once you've gone through this process, you might be able to kind of tweak your exact dates. But I would say like, if you think you're gonna be done with your first project by March 12th, then give yourself an additional two weeks time before you book that editor. Just give yourself time. So yeah, I see, I definitely see a couple of um, people saying, yes, they'd love a video on editors. So I'm going to add that to my list for next year. So let's say I did the 21 days for edits and now I need to figure out how many days for publishing. So because I am a publishing author, I'm going to need to figure out how many days do I need to take off from doing other things like writing to work on the publishing and promoting of this book. So let's say on average, I'm gonna take a full week, so I'm gonna take seven days. So then what I would do is I would go to my calendar and I would count out the next seven days after the 20th. Um, now, this is where I said things get a little bit tricky because it's going to depend on your process. And if you finish a rough draft and you have like three weeks off before you like to tackle your edits, it's just a personal thing. Do you wanna work on plotting your second project while that other book is just resting? 
or do you just need those three weeks off? Be realistic about what you need and then apply it to the calendar the way you need it. And, um, you know, that's really the best I can do without knowing everybody's situation, but hopefully that does make sense and give you a little bit of guidance. But if you, if you get to the end of your edits and you're like, okay, I need three weeks off, you've got to give yourself those three weeks and you need to be realistic about whether you're going to be working on another project during those three weeks or not. So hopefully that does make sense. Um, let's see. Denali says, what if we plan on starting our anchor series, but want to hold back the first three books before publishing? Should we get each book edited as we go or wait and edit the first three all at once? So it kind of depends, but I think that, um, it depends on your timeline, but it also depends on whether or not you're writing the kind of series that would benefit from you putting in plants and reveals as you go, if that makes sense. Um, if you get to book three and you realize, oh, I could have put a little clue about this in book one, then maybe you want to just write all three rough drafts and then go back to edit. And it kind of depends on the type of series that you're writing the way you want to write it christy makes a good point that if you if you write the first one go ahead and send it out to your editor then you've at least got your expenses are being kind of um, instead of that huge bill that you're going to get for editing three books at once you could have them kind of spread out a little bit more but it also depends how deep of an edit you're getting are you getting a content edit are you getting a copy edit or are you just getting a proofread so it kind of depends so i think i'll have to do another video on editing so um all right so um the, my novel is resting and i have two people reading it so you might have beta readers or other people reading it and then the question you need to ask yourself is will i be working on other stuff while that novel is resting. And if the answer is no, and you just yourself, you're resting, then you have to just mark those off as not working days. But if you are going to be plotting, then what you could do is you could, you know, hit your 20 days and then take out your pink pen and you can start doing like, okay, well, this, this is done. And I'm going to start day one is going to be, you know, project, this project, you know, will be in pink. So that's the way I like to do my schedule. But like I said, it's, it's hard to cover it for a large group of people because everybody's going to kind of approach it differently. Um, but I think as you get into this process and you read my examples and you really start looking at it, how it fits in your life, then you will be able to figure it out. But if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I have given you space on the worksheet for nine projects. Now, before you freak out and go, nine, she's expecting us to write nine books. Ah. I wanted to make sure there was enough space for people that are writing short stories, novellas, shorter works, or there are people out there who are writing nine plus books a year. I have a friend who writes 10 books a year. I don't know how she does it. I can't do it. I don't try to do it. The important thing to remember is that this is not something that I've put on there to trigger some kind of comparison of say, oh, I think I'm kind of out of focus here. Focus me. Um, this is not like a way to compare yourself to other people and go, oh man, look at, that means there's people here doing nine. Like, don't let that trigger you. There could be people writing nine, 10,000 word short stories. It's not about how many projects you're doing. It's about being realistic about yourself. This is your journey. It belongs to you. And don't worry about what anybody else is doing. You may get to these projects and you may only have one next year. But if that's the first novel you ever finished in your life, man, that is going to feel good. And if you get it done in 2019, then that will be the best year you ever had. So don't let that trigger you. Let it be your journey, your projects. Don't worry that I'm expecting you to have nine. If you are writing short stories or you just are very prolific and you write more than nine, then you can just print an extra sheet and just cover up the number and like white out and renumber those. But that is the basic system. So what I want you guys to do is head over to heartbreathings.com slash blog, or if you're on my email list already, go download it from your email and download this workbook. It's 17 pages. It'll give you this process 
process of going through marking off all your vacation days, marking off all the like estimated days that you might need for like mental health reasons or for unexpected illnesses or just things that pop up like, oh gosh, the PTA needed me to do this fundraiser and now I don't have time to write for three days. Give yourself that time and then go through your schedule estimating how much time you need. Now somebody asked the question like if I've never finished a book or edited a book, how do I know how long it's going to take me? So I wanna address that real quick. Number one is, um, sorry, I, I'm still trying to like learn how to like sort of read comments and keep my brain working in the background. So if I pause, it's just because I'm like actually got caught on a comment there. Um, so anyway, number one, figure out your average word count per day or per hour. So if you know you, you can write an hour a day on your working days, and you can write a thousand words an hour, then you know you can write about a thousand words a day. Then you estimate how much your rough draft is gonna be. I think it's gonna come in around 60,000 words. Then you know when you're filling out your little box here that you're gonna estimate 60 working days for that, you know, when you're fill filling this out, you'll estimate 60 working days for that project, for the rough draft. If you've never gotten to the editing stage, then where I would suggest you start is giving yourself as much time for edits as you did for the rough draft. So if you think it's gonna take you 60 days, hey Yasmin, if you think it's gonna take you 60 days to write the rough draft, then give yourself 60 days to edit. And then keep track of how long it takes you. So what I would do is actually keep track on this or inside your planner so that as you go and you you finished a few projects you'll start to see you know what it doesn't actually take me 60 days to edit it only takes me 30 days to edit you'll get a better feel for that as you go right now it's just going to be a best guess scenario if you've never finished or you've never edited it's a guessing game but as a general rule i think if you give yourself the same amount of time it took you to write the rough draft to do the edits, you're gonna be kind of in a safe zone. And you may find later that, oh gosh, it took me twice as long. And that's fine too, because at least you learned and now you're more powerful because you have more information at your fingertips. All right, so we're going a little bit over an hour, but I, um, before we close up, I wanted to just end with this thought. For those of us that constantly say, I'm gonna be my very best. I'm gonna have the very best year I've ever had. And what that means for us when it translates into not being realistic is we're, you know, we wanna be different people. You say, January 1st, I wanna be somebody else. I wanna be the kind of person that gets up and writes five hours every day. Or I wanna be the kind of person that can write six novels in a year. And it's great to want to improve ourselves. It's great to want to be our best version of ourselves. But where the danger comes in, especially for those of us who are true creative beings, is that to expect yourself to go from zero to 100 miles per hour overnight is just fear talking. It's setting yourself up for failure. It's something in the back of your subconscious mind that's saying who you are is not enough. And that's just not true. It's a lie you're telling yourself. If you truly want to change your life, to change your habits, to change your routines, to feel more in control, where you start is not by expecting yourself to be the very best person you have ever been. And by best, you mean I have to write 900,000 words next year and be like five times my best year ever. That is not how you become enough or a better person. The way that you get more done, and it sounds so counterintuitive to the way we usually do things, but the way you get more done is to step back and be more realistic and more deliberate and intentional about the time you actually have. Set yourself up for success instead of setting yourself up for failure by the second week of the year. Trust me, trust me, trust me on this. I think it is true. Like a lot of times I say, in my opinion, I think this is true for all of us. If you want to truly change your life and you're a procrastinator or you're someone who is constantly overestimating what you can do in a year, 
one of the best gifts that you can give yourself this holiday season and this new year celebration is to be more realistic and more deliberate about where you're spending your time. Because when you get realistic and you focus in on the most important things, instead of thinking you can take on the world, you actually will get more done because you're not wasting your time feeling like you're not good enough, saying negative things to yourself, feeling depressed, feeling overwhelmed. When you take that pressure off your shoulders of always feeling overwhelmed or feeling like you can't do it, you can transform your life. I promise you this. And this is one of the main reasons that I felt so passionate about starting this channel, about speaking to other authors, because I feel like a lot of the average out there, like the, the average or a lot of the advice out there is people telling you, well, if you want a career, you have to, you have to write super fast. You have to push yourself super hard. You have to spend all this money on ads. You have to blah, 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 blah. And people don't think about, it's not success. is not just about writing as many books as you can, as fast as you can. It is truly about finding a way to be happy in your life. That is what success means to me. And we all define it differently, I know. But you, you're not gonna be happy pushing yourself to the limit and it's not sustainable. And take it from someone who burned out and could not do anything. The best gift you can give yourself is to be realistic because you don't wake up on January 1st a different person. You just don't. But one of my favorite quotes from Tony Robbins is that he says most, like when you, oh, I got to get it right. Hold on. He says, when you, I was on a roll there and now I, I forgot it. I want to get it right because it's so important. It's one of my favorite favorites. And now I can't find it. Um, aha, I got it. Once you have mastered time, you will understand how true it is that most people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they can achieve in a decade. This world right now is all about short term. How many books can I write this year? How, how fast can I get this done? How can I make a quick buck? How can I do this? But for lasting success in this business, lasting success and joy in your life, you have to be thinking long term. Instead of telling yourself, I have to have the most I've ever done this year and I have to set myself up for this unrealistic goals. Try giving yourself, going through this system, working through this plan and giving yourself a realistic time frame to finish these projects and just see at the end of 2019 how it feels to look back and be like, holy cow, I just achieved all of my goals for the year. Because as someone who has actually done it, like, one of my goals was I really, really want to be a public speaker. I want to get out there. I want to, you know, start a YouTube channel. I want to, you know, be asked to speak at conferences. Um, I want to get my message out there because I'm super passionate about it. But I also want to write these five books this year. And I want to move my family to Charleston. And I had all these things. Like I always wanted to live on the marsh. And, you know, as someone who finally, after extreme burnout and thinking that I was never going to achieve my goals in life, turned around and said, instead of setting myself up for failure and focusing on fear, I am going to, as often as possible, focus on joy and get out of this feeling that I have to push myself to the max and instead give myself the space to be creative. It transformed my life. So I really, really would like to give you that gift as well. So head over to heartbreathings.com slash blog, and it's the very first post that has the 2019 writing schedule on it. You can, um, you just sign up for my mailing list and you can download it. Um, if you don't want to necessarily get emails from me, you can sign up for the list, grab the download, and you can unsubscribe at any time, no big deal. Um, if you enjoyed this, if this has made an impact on you, but you want to go deeper and you really want to set your goals like I said, I do this, but then I also plan every 90 days of the year when it comes to everything else. And this is something super, super helpful to me that has been a part of my transformation. If you want to learn about that, I am running a three-day intensive boot camp called the HB90 boot camp. It is a three-day boot camp starting on Thursday night with a live call, and then it goes through next weekend. Um, 
there will be a link on my blog for you to sign up for that boot camp. It is $30 off currently, so it's $119 and it comes with a free HB90 method planner. Or if you don't have the funds right now for um, the boot camp, you can grab my planning system in my planner over on Etsy, which is only $15. Um, or of course, a lot of the things that we talk about, I discuss for free in my videos as well. Um, there are also still a couple of coaching sessions available through my boot camp. So if you sign up for the boot camp, you will have a chance to do four coaching calls with me for an, another price. Um, but I'm giving a super, super discounted price for that. And I have, I think, four slots open for next year. Um, but anyway, either way, even if you guys don't want to buy any courses or anything, I am going to be here for you in 2019. So please send me any ideas that you have. Like I saw a few requests for like marketing, editing videos. Um, and I'll go back through the comments. So if there's other things that you would love to see for me in 2019, I am already planning my 2019 content calendar and I would love to be here for you and to share with you next year. So feel free to email me at sarah at heartbreathings.com and let me know what you would like to see. All right, guys, I will see you guys next week. I've got some cool videos coming up talking about my notebook collection. Um, best ways to actually use up all your notebooks. Give me a yes if you have a bunch of unused notebooks <laughs> in your house. Um, and I'm also gonna be doing a notebook giveaway every single month of 2019 to help get rid of some of my crazy pile up obsession of notebooks. I'm gonna be doing some videos on why I write inside Google Docs as well as a series Bible. Um, notebook or series bible video so lots of really good stuff coming up for me so hopefully you guys will stick around if you are not subscribed to this channel please subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you will get notified whenever new videos come up for me thank you thank you thank you guys so so much for all showing up i told my husband i think the most i've ever had on a live video here on facebook was like 80 or 90 people and i said how awesome would it be to get to 100 today and we knocked it out of the parks like 160 people were here live for most of it so thank you thank you for helping to make some of my dreams come true this year too all right guys i love you the replay will be up in just a few minutes if you missed the beginning all right i will talk to you guys later bye